from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead for you today, K-State's Ignacio Ciampitti will discuss economic efficiency in row crop production. That's a theme that he talked up at the recent series of K-State crop production schools around Kansas. He promotes the idea of maximizing productivity per unit of crop input. He'll explain that. Following Ignacio then, K-State's Jeff Whitworth advising you wheat and alfalfa growers to be watchful now for signs of army cutworm feeding on that early crop growth. He'll talk about determining the need for treating these pests. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Ward Upham will go over the simple but important guidelines for planting a new landscape tree this spring. All this and more coming up on Agriculture Today. When a thunderstorm approaches, follow these safety tips. Lightning, known as the underrated killer, usually strikes the tallest objects. So avoid standing beneath trees or other isolated tall objects. Take shelter in a sturdy building. Remember, if you're close enough to hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck by lightning. Help keep you and your family safe this severe weather season. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. This is the K-State Radio Network, and we're glad to have you listening in once again for another Agriculture Today. Our guest has been a road warrior the last several weeks and even months out and across the state of Kansas as he's been an active participant in the K-State row crop production schools throughout Kansas. And we've brought him by today for several reasons, one of which is to look back at some of the prime topics that producers brought up during that series of corn, grain sorghum, and soybean production schools. And, of course, to look ahead to this growing season, which is not very far around the corner. Ignacio C.M. Pitti is with us, crop production specialist with K-State Research and Extension. So, Ignacio, to the point of exhaustion, <laughs> as a major part of those schools throughout the state this past several weeks? Yeah, I mean, thanks as always, Eric, for the invitation. We have an excellent winter in terms of events. I would say that uh, quite successful. We were going from six uh, corn schools in total. We have soybean schools. Also, we have uh, six in total. And then we have uh, three sorghum schools this year, we, I was experiencing a little more interaction between the speakers and audience, I mean, more participation. There were more questions touching the economics, which I think that was a key point. In the past, we focused in many situations about trying to help farmers to improve the operation and productivity. And, and today, most of the focus is considering the economics and making sure that we are capturing the best yield possible with a potentially minimum input. Well, let's venture into that since that was brought up by producers. How do they economize on their crop production without sacrificing yield to a dramatic extent? What was that interaction like? Well, for example, if you you go specifically, let's focus on the corn schools. One of the things that I emphasize multiple times, and I think that it still is relevant, is fine-tuning your seeing rates. In many situations, it's not about working at the field level in in the sense of saying, I will cut this field from 24,000 plants or seeds to 20,000. But it's about trying to understand the variability that you have in your field and manage your field in different zones. There are situations that you have 10, 20 acres that they are low productivity and then 50, 60 acres that they are high productivity. So the question around that topic of saying, Potentially, we might don't finish uh, saving cost by diminishing or reducing the amount of seed that you are buying. But at the end of the day, what we are doing is allocating that seed and those inputs more efficiently. And then in the case of a low-yielding environment, there are situations that adding more inputs to those environments. Basically, they don't pay off. They don't help you on increasing productivity. And in many situations, like in the case of seeding rate, adding more seeds or plants to those environments, it might do the opposite, which basically you are increasing the stress of the plants in an environment that will not be able to carry out with that number of plants. And then by adding more plants, you decrease the yields. So and then you are not saving money by (laughs) cutting on costs, and then you are losing, in some cases, not a lot, but you might lose 5, 10 bushels 
by just adding an extra level of stress to that environment. And then on the high-yielding environment is the opportunity the farmers can allocate those resources in a more efficient approach, potentially maintaining the, the use of resources, but adding more resources to that environment, increasing productivity, and then per unit of input at the field level, then you are maximizing basically productivity per unit of input. And all of that would apply as well to grain, sorghum, and soybeans, would it not? In many situations, will apply to multiple crops. The only difference that you will find is in corn, corn is one of the crops that is really uh, high technology demand. And most of the breeding improvement that we have done in the last uh, 30, 40 years, it has been possible also because of changes in management. Many of our corn farmers, they specialized. They just do corn, they do it really well. And many of those guys, they do it with really good input. Mm-hmm. Okay? So they invest on the corn, and they, it's a crop that if you invest resources and if you do it right, it will pay off. And then you will be seeing that jump on productivity. Soybeans, we have many farmers doing 150,000 seeds or 160,000 seeds, and we know that we can go low. I mean, we have an, enough on-farm research studies showing us that if we can get 100,000 effective plants in the field, we are in a good shape for the growing season. So how do you get there is the challenge. Because if a farmer is planting in a poor soil condition, saturated soil conditions, bad temperature, so you need to add more plants. But if you do it well, because the wind planting window on soybeans is quite broad, if you do it well, you have a high chances of success. And by maybe just shooting for 120,000 seeds, you get 100,000 with no problem, okay? So soybeans on, on cutting costs, I think that we have some opportunity on seeing rates. And then on sorghum, I think that we still have some opportunities of finding the balance between investing resources to make sure that the crop will do well. And I think that in some situations, uh, I have this kind of a feeling that we try in many situations not to invest any resource on sorghum. Just rough it, so to speak. Exactly. And then, and I think that we are missing opportunities on those situations. So I try to discuss with farmers on and show them, we have a study that we conducted the last two years, and we show them that a sorghum yield gain over time in the last 50 years increased close to one bushel per acre per year. So to make sure that we do some level of investment so the crop can respond. I mean, again, this is a topic I think that for the years to come is how we can find this uh, sweet spot and maximizing the productivity for the amount of resources that we are investing. We are not talking about anymore about high yielding or high productivity or maximizing yield. We are talking all the time about maximizing that productivity per unit of input, Mm -hmm. always relative to the input cost. So what you're really suggesting widely to growers is for them to step back, if they haven't already, and reassess their management, their production, their inputs that go into that crop, and figure out for their situation what will be the most economically advantageous. Yeah, and sometimes they will be quite surprised that with small changes, we're not discussing about abrupt, I mean, big, large changes. With very small changes, they will be able to save substantially cost in some sections and then also to improve the productivity and efficiency. That's one of the main things we start discussing with multiple farmers, thinking on efficiency, thinking about improving productivity per unit of input is for sure the concept that we need to move forward on more looking at the perspective on prices on on the commodities. I mean, nothing seems to be changing or might change in the next uh, coming years in terms of prices. I mean, and even if they change, we are training people and farmers that they will be much better off to maximize profits even in good economic uh, environments. Lastly and briefly here, Ignacio, the first crop to go on the ground of those three will obviously be corn. As growers approach that time, and what do producers outside of seeding rate need to be thinking about specifically to corn? Yeah. Well, I always say to corn something very simple, uniformity. How do you achieve the best uniformity in your corn possible? When we think about that uniformity, there are a couple of concepts connected to soil temperature, Above 55 degrees, 55, a two inch of uh, soil depth, there are interactions between 
the level of salt moisture in the profile. So if you are in a good level of moisture, the usually is something that will not fluctuate too much in the next coming weeks. But if you are in a drier situation, that 55 in the next week, if you have a cold front coming, it will come back to maybe 40s. You want stability in that We sort want of some stability and I always tell to the farmers, don't be tempted to go too early. And then if you do it, be careful on looking at the forecast for the next two weeks. We know that the reliability on the forecast, will, as we move farther away from today, the, is increasing on ins- uncertainty. But at least when you are taking the decision, look at that forecast. So you do it with some level of confidence. So unless you are shooting for extremely high yields, planting early doesn't add too much into the question. Examples of uh, situations that we did in the past, planting last week of March, even some situations, extreme situations, first week of April, we usually get that corn after 21 days up. Uniformity in many situations is compromised because we have a small topography changes in the soil with different interaction between temperature, residue, moisture, <laughs> micro interactions in micro spots and then you have maybe one plant coming up really soon the other one comes up two or three weeks after and then you look at that stand and it looks awful yeah (laughs) so if you wait until the third week of april what you gain is those plants coming up in 10 days good uniformity and less 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 possibilities of having that cold front that will come and basically will create that issue of losing plants early in the season so think about that many of the things that we do at planting will basically set the tone of what type of crop are we growing for the rest of the growing season. And with that, off we roll very soon into another growing season for our row crops, starting with corn. So that means we'll have you back on a regular basis, Ignacio, to talk more about crop productivity and management as we push on through the season. Thank you. Thanks. Crop Production Specialist Ignacio Ciampitti, K-State Research and Extension. You're listening to Agriculture Today. We'll be back on the K-State Radio Network. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128-plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today is back now. Spring is coming on at long last, and so too may be insect pressure, believe it or not. In our field crops, it's our first chance of the spring to talk with Jeff Whitworth, who's a crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, and concentrating on one pest that's already making its presence known out there, you tell us, Jeff, and our wheat and alfalfa growers need to be alert to it anyway. That would be the army cutworm. What's happening out there? Yes, this insect is one of my favorites just because of its biology or its history or whatever you want to call it. It is a late fall arrival in Kansas and it will feed all winter long and then will start actually causing problems in late spring. Actually, when we first notice army cutworm moths is usually right around Memorial Day weekend. I'll kind of start at the beginning They're really a nuisance. It depends on the year, but a lot of people call them Miller moths because they can aggregate in huge numbers. They're attracted to lights. Those are army cutworm adults usually, and they call them Miller moths. What happens is those moths then generally over summer in the Rockies, someplace above about 3,000 feet, and they do it by the millions. I mean, these think about the flight from Kansas all the way across western Kansas, eastern Colorado to the mountains. Quite a haul, isn't it? It is quite a haul for just a little moth. Once they get there, they crawl under rocks or logs or under bark, and they're readily eaten by raccoons and bears and lots of other predators because they're a great source of protein. So a lot of them are consumed in the adult stage after they get to their oversummering sites. But then come... You know, late summer, early fall, those moths take off and fly back 
to Kansas and other points. And the females then will start laying eggs in eastern Colorado, western Kansas. And usually they get all the way to about, you know, maybe uh, 75 highway in Kansas uh, coming from the west where they will lay eggs. Again, it depends on the weather. Sometimes they'll get a little further east into Kansas, but at least, you know, the western half of the state, all the way north to south, doesn't matter. So they will lay eggs September, October, November, and they lay eggs right around in loose soil or in cracks and crevices. Generally, agriculturally, they're, we're concerned because at that time, the only green crops we have are alfalfa and wheat. Mm-hmm. So that's why we have problems with alfalfa and wheat. The army cutworm larva will eat trees. They'll eat lawns, gardens. They don't care. But in the fall, when the female moths coming back laying eggs, usually the only thing they have to lay their eggs around that's green, which is the host for the larvae, are wheat and alfalfa. And sometimes they come a little early and we don't have a lot of wheat. That's why we sometimes we'll have a lot of pressure in alfalfa. But they can also get in canola. They can really cause problems in canola fields. So they lay these eggs and each moth, each female moth can lay 1,000 to 2,000 eggs. So that's a lot. And most of the time, survivorship's pretty good with these larvae. They'll hatch in the fall then. They hatch in the fall. You know, a week after the eggs are laid, they hatch. Again, depends upon the temperatures. But the larvae will go around the base of the plant, and they'll feed around the base of the plant. Anytime the temperature's over 45 to 50 degrees in the winter, the larvae will feed. So they don't really diapause or hibernate. Uh, They just become quiet uh, right below the soil surface if it's really cold. And then they start feeding all during the winter. This is not like any of the other worms. So if you have worms in your wheat or your alfalfa going into the fall, if it's any other worm, they will die out. They won't be there in the winter. If they're feeding all winter long and now into early spring, those are army cutworms. The thing is right now, they're tough to find because they're small. So they do what we call window painting on the alfalfa leaves or the wheat. The easiest way I find them now is you drive around, if you see a flock of birds, seagulls or blackbirds or any kind of birds, uh, turkeys, I've seen flocks of turkeys out in fields, wheat or alfalfa fields, if they're feeding, milling around out in the field, Stop and go out and look. That's a pretty good indication that there's army cutworms are out there because they feed on these worms, and those are the only kind of worms that are going to be out this time of year, I mean, other than like a grub worm. But for the most part, you're looking for army cutworms, and that's that's how you're going to find them early on while they're small. But as they grow, as the temperatures warm up, they get larger, and they can do more damage. The nice thing, if you could call it that, I guess the nice thing about army cutworms They only feed above the soil surface. They're not like other cutworms that can cut the plant below the soil surface. They just feed above the soil surface. You know, if if we have good growing conditions, the wheat can tiller and can stay ahead of a pretty good infestation of army cutworms. But what happens is lots of times we don't get good growing conditions till later on. And these army cutworms start feeding. As they get larger, they consume more and more tissue. And they can be a real problem. So we've had fairly decent weather of late, Jeff, to maybe promote early growth, very slow in the going so far. Would that put those crops a bit ahead of the army cutworm pressure potentially or not? Yes. The problems I've seen over the years with army cutworms is in alfalfa for the most part because a lot of times we don't have a good stand of wheat, so the female moths lay their eggs in the alfalfa, and so they can accumulate a lot of eggs in a small space, uh, and they'll start feeding on the alfalfa. And you know alfalfa you know, hasn't, well, as of now, I don't think it's broken dormancy. I was just checking a little bit. It probably will before long, so it's really not going to hurt the alfalfa until it starts breaking dormancy, but we're getting close, and the worms are getting larger, okay? So once that happens, if the alfalfa doesn't grow and we have a pretty good infestation of army cutworm larvae, they can set that alfalfa back considerably. Then the problem you get, you get alfalfa weevils hatching on top of that, and over the years, we've tried to put out alfalfa weevil and army cutworm insecticide trials where you get a kill of both 
species with one treatment. That's really tough to do because of the of the timing. But that's one of the problems. You get army cutworms another month when the alfalfa weevils are starting to uh, become active. They're going to become pretty large, and they're going to have fed on quite a bit of tissue. The alfalfa makes it a little more difficult to find the larvae also because in wheat, the female will lay the eggs around the base of the plants in the loose soil. So you can go out, and if you see a some spot in uh, in your wheat field where it looks like maybe it's not greening up quite as quickly as other spots, you can go out and take your knife or dig around a little bit around the loose soil around the plants. You can find the larvae. In alfalfa, it's not that easy because of the canopy. Plus, you usually have quite a bit of residue below the canopy on the soil surface, and that's where they're hiding down in that part of it. So it's a little more difficult to determine the infestation level in alfalfa, but that's usually where we have problems. Um, we haven't had as many problems in wheat over the years as we have had in alfalfa just because you've got a lot more army cutworms in alfalfa usually feeding early. But again, like the alfalfa weevil, they're only probably only going to affect that first cutting. But as you know, that can snowball on you, mm-hmm. where that first cutting, if you lose that or if you lose quite a bit of foliage off that, that second cutting is not going to be as good either. So, you know, in the next, probably the next week or two, according to what I've seen in the forecast, the temperature should be ideal for army cutworm feeding. So if you do have worms in your field, that damage should start to show up and or you might start seeing more birds or skunks or other critters out there feeding on the worms. If that's the case, get out there and look and, and check the situation out. And the army cutworm larva, it's it's kind of a indistinct-looking little dark brown worm with some light stripes on the side. But if there are cutworm-looking larvae out there now, that's what it is, this army cutworm. And is it too early then to start talking about treatment thresholds in alfalfa in particular? Well, I, I probably wouldn't start talking about it until it breaks dormancy. But it sure pays to get out and check right now. Get out and scout your fields. Generally, again, treatment thresholds are pretty dynamic. We kind of talk about in uh, seedling alfalfa or new alfalfa, it doesn't take as many larvae as it does in an established stand. In seedling alfalfa, you know, if you got four or five larvae and we don't have really good growing conditions, they can do a number on that alfalfa. Per square foot. Per square foot, yes. Uh, and when you get to wheat, uh, it doesn't take quite that many in wheat. But again, I would wait till it's broken dormancy because uh, until it does, they can they can remove that leaf tissue and it's not going to impact anything as long as it has a good root system. So in wheat, it's probably one to two per square foot. Again, they're really small right now. Uh, Another two weeks, three weeks, depending upon the temperature, they're going to grow and they're going to start causing more and more feeding damage. Well, with some regularity just about every year, it is among the first field crop insects to debut in the early spring, the army cutworm. Wheat and especially you alfalfa growers start watching for it here anytime now. And Jeff, as always, we appreciate the input. We'll have you back soon with this new growing season just about upon us now. Many thanks. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. That's Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. And we'll be back with more on this agriculture today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Now in our 96th year of broadcast service to agriculture, this is the K-State Radio Network, and you're listening to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Now today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
With questions growing about China's commitment to buy U.S. agriculture commodities as that country deals with the coronavirus outbreak, the ranking member of the House Agriculture Committee yesterday urged the Trump administration to consider approving a third round of market facilitation program payments. As part of the Phase 1 trade agreement with the U.S., China committed to buying 40 to $50 billion of agricultural products this year. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue told the committee that the Chinese currently remain on track to fill that commitment. Now, Democrats on the committee questioned what they said was a regional bias in which producers received MFP payments. That's a claim that Purdue said was untrue. More on that in a second. Committee ranking member Mike Conaway of Texas said the administration's action likely saved the livelihoods of many farmers across the country. Purdue told the committee the administration's plan is to not make a third round of MFP payments this year unless the situation warrants it. More now from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. What was at the top of the agenda when Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue testified before the House Agriculture Committee? This is not my prepared remarks, but I want to go ahead and address the issue that you mentioned about a third market facilitation pro- program. Uh, I'm telling farmers to do what they've always do, done, and part plant for the market. He acknowledged President Trump's recent tweet on the subject, but said the program would go into force only if there are continued trade disruptions. I'm telling farmers not to anticipate one, don't expect one. We know there will be some weaning pressure here as people have come to be comfortable with that. Our goal is not to continue a market facilitation program in the ongoing future. He told Congress that, in other words... So if we see trade increase and prices don't go up, that's a market signal to, to farmers who are producing too much. Don't look for us to support a market facilitation program as a price support program. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. However, Conaway countered, telling Purdue that a third round of MFP payments may be necessary as producers across the country wait to see the payoff from the reopening of markets to China in 2020. The secretary said although 2019 was tough for agriculture, producers are optimistic for better times in this year. Committee Chairman Representative Colin Peterson of Minnesota said he remains skeptical about how soon those markets to China could reopen. Purdue said... The USDA was disappointed that commodity prices did not respond to the signing of the phase one deal with China, but said he remains optimistic again that the markets will return. By the way, the top states that received MFP payments included Iowa, $1.6 billion, Illinois, $1.4 billion, Texas at $1.1 billion, Minnesota, $1.1 billion, and Kansas right at $1 billion. Now, economists at the Agricultural and Food Policy Center in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Texas A&M University released a report on the MFP and its impact. They say while there was significant variability in county payment rates for MFP 2.0, most of that variability is easily explained, they say, by the underlying damage assessments and the distribution of planted acres in the respective counties. The report goes on to say despite the fact that the Highest county payment rates were predominantly in counties with cotton production. Almost 70 percent of the assistance under MFP 2.0 went to Midwestern states. And the report adds, while we find little validity to the argument of regional inequity, there certainly were disparities between neighboring counties. Further, the report said that the two MFP efforts thus far had a greater than $41 billion impact on the broader rural economy. Next up for you, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. And with that is Greg Akagi. Greg? Bob Hazelwood, a Barrington, Kansas farmer, joins us, and he serves as chairman of the Kansas Soybean Commission. Bob, the Kansas Soybean Commission has a regular meeting on March 27th, but during that meeting, you will be discussing potential nominees for the United Soybean Board. That's one of our duties as a Kansas Soybean Commission. We are a qualified state soybean board, and that's one of our duties to appoint a person to the serve as a United Soybean Board Director. We currently have three directors from Kansas, and we have one of them's term, his three-year term is expiring in December, so we have to appoint someone or reappoint the person that's in that position. So we are currently taking applications for that position. So if someone is interested in applying for that, take us through the process of what they need to do. First off, if they want to, they can call the soybean office at 8 
877-577-6923 and talk to someone. They will send them out an application or they can go to our website, kansassoybeans.org slash forms and should be able to find the application for the USB director slot on that website. And Bob, if there is a farmer out there that wants to be considered for that position, is there a deadline they need to get that in by? Yes. Our soybean commission is meeting on March 27th, and at that through that meeting, we will consider all applications at that time. I would suggest they make sure that they have it back to the office maybe the day before that so that we can conduct that business anytime during the meeting. And as far as the person who is nominated, and who would serve at that position, that is a three-year position that would begin when? The time that they start will be December of this year when the new term would start. The United Soybean Board holds a meeting every December. You know, it depends a little bit on the calendar. The appointment is done by the Secretary of Agriculture because we just, as a qualified state soybean board, is just making a nomination, and the Secretary of Ag actually makes the appointment. And once again, they need to get that in by March 23rd. Uh, But give the number and website once again that they can do that. The phone number is 877-577-6923. Or they can go on to our website, and it's kansassoybeans.org slash forms. All right, Bob, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is Bob Hazelwood, who serves as the chairman of the Kansas Soybean Commission. He joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. Greg Akagi there. And wanted to slip in one final reminder about the 107th Cattleman's Day here at Kansas State University. It is set for tomorrow at Weber Hall and Arena here on the campus. The day starting at 8 o'clock with the refreshments, educational exhibits, commercial trade show, the formal program at 10 with Lorna Marshall of Select Sires on genetic and reproductive trends in the global beef industry and Oklahoma State University's Daryl Peel on opportunities for the beef industry in global meat markets. Plus, much more. Register at the door, $35. And, uh, of course, they'll have that fine lunch which will be plugged in there before the afternoon presentations. Cattleman's Day here at Kansas State tomorrow. Hope to see you there. This is Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. For you now on Agriculture Today, our weekly horticulture segment. And with spring rapidly rushing in now, at least we hope so, those of you who are intending to place a new landscape tree into your setting, some thoughts for you today on accomplishing that successfully with Ward Up, I'm along, horticulturist with K-State Research and Extension. Tree planting takes some good preparation and good technique, doesn't it, Ward? It certainly does, and it's a little bit different on whether you have a bald and burlap tree or whether it's container grown. So bald and burlap is going to be wrapped in burlap and then have little pins hold that burlap in place. If it's container grown, it means it grows in a pot. So if it's bald and burlap, before you dig your hole, you need to check to make sure that there isn't too much soil on top of that ball. Oftentimes in a nursery, when they control weeds, they'll throw dirt against the trunk of that tree. And that needs to be taken off until you get down to what we call the root flare. That's where that trunk starts to swell and those roots form. Uh, There may not be any there, okay? It's possible. But sometimes there can be as much as six inches on top of that root ball that needs to come off. If you plant a tree too deep, it's never going to do as well as if you plant it at the correct depth. So that'll tell you how deep to plant. That'll plant. Yeah, that'll tell you how deep you plant it because you don't want that tree planted any deeper than it needs to be. Because if you have a depression there, water collects, you can drown that tree because water collects and you've driven out all the oxygen. Those roots need oxygen just as much as they need water. No such concern with container-grown trees? No container-grown. We'll get into a little bit more what we need to watch on them. It's a different thing, but uh, there are also some special preparations for them as well. Well, 
let's talk about those preparations. And it gets right to digging of the hole and doing that right. Depth and width is what that's all about. Yeah. So I mentioned the depth, no deeper than what that tree was sitting in the nursery or where that root flare starts. But that width is also very important. You want it at least two to three times as wide as the diameter of the root ball. And the reason for that is you want those roots to go into that surrounding soil easily so that tree can get established quickly. Now there's a question of organic matter. You know, you can add organic matter if you add the organic matter to the top of that soil and mix it in before you dig your hole. What you don't want to do is dig the hole, mix organic matter with that fill soil and put it right back in. Because if that soil is a heavy soil, you're going to fill that hole up with water and again you're going to drown your tree. But if you add your organic matter, mix it in before you dig your hole, you should be okay. Especially if you make it at least two to three times the width of that root ball. So probably about two inches on top, but feather it out toward the edge of that hole. Roots do not like to go from one type of soil to another. And so you want to make sure that that transition from high organic matter to low organic matter is gradual. Then you can dig your hole, and then you're ready to set the tree. As far as the hole size for container grown, different rules here? It'll be the same. Again, that root ball is going to be smaller than it is with bald and burlap. Mm -hmm. And so you probably want to go three times instead of just twice. But when you take that plant out of that pot, you're going to notice most of those roots are going to go in a circle. You've got to stop that from continuing to happen. A couple of ways to do that. One is just to take your fingers and fluff those roots out on the outside of that root ball. Or you can take a knife and cut about an inch deep on all four sides of that root ball. What you don't want is those roots to continue to go in a circle because that can damage that tree and it really slows the establishment. And so either of those methods will get those roots out into the surrounding soil so, again, that tree can get established quickly. And... In the case of the ball and burlap, before we move on, does one need to remove that burlap or leave it be? Yeah, so go ahead and remove it. Remove as much as you can. Now, if it's on the bottom and it's going to be really tricky to get rid of it, fine. Just cut away as much as you can and get rid of all that stuff. If there's a wire cage, that also needs to come out, except, again, if it's on the bottom and you have trouble getting it off, just cut it away. And so that way you don't have anything keeping those roots from going all the way through and into that surrounding soil. What happens sometimes, you leave it on. If you have any part of that burlap sticking above the surface of the soil, it'll wick that moisture right out of the soil. And so it needs to come off. So you've done the preparation. You've placed the tree in the hole, proper depth, proper width. What's next? So now you need to water it in. Make sure that you have good contact between the soil and those roots. You don't want any air pockets. What a lot of people will do is fill that hole halfway full, water it in once, and fill it the rest of the way, and water it in a second time. That makes sure you get plenty of water and good root soil contact. And then from then on, you're going to water maybe once a week, unless you have rain. You know, if you have enough rain, you don't have to worry about it. That first year is going to be really important to keep that tree watered and the surrounding soil watered so those roots can move into moist soil. One other thing, you don't need to fertilize. That first year, fertilizer doesn't produce anything, any new growth or anything. So after the first year, you can go ahead and fertilize. It's not going to hurt anything to fertilize that first year, but it's not going to help. Ward, how about, and this is pertinent to Kansas, stabilizing that tree against our somewhat brisk winds at times? So with staking, it depends on how big that tree if it is. If it's a small tree, you can usually get away without staking. That tree does need to move a little bit. If it doesn't, if you totally immobilize that trunk, that tree is going to be weaker when you take those stakes off. However, in Kansas, if you have a tree of any size, and with our strong winds, if you're in a windy location, you probably need to stake. And so what you want to do is use strong wire, but don't put that wire around the tree. You put it through like a section of garden hose, something like that, so it doesn't harm the tree. And keep it a little bit loose. You're not trying to mobilize the trunk. What you're trying to do is keep that root ball from moving. You want that trunk to move a little bit because as it moves, it'll increase in girth and actually make that tree stronger. It also becomes established faster if that trunk can move a little bit. So a little bowing actually is helpful for the tree for the long pull. That is. And then that can be left in place that first season and then take it off. Don't forget to take it off and don't forget to take any wires or tags or anything else off or you're going to girdle a branch or possibly the whole tree. 
One final thing here you bring up, the itch to prune those trees into a preferred shape a little early to think about that, you say? It is, because each one of those buds on the top part of the tree releases a hormone that encourages rooting. So that first year, that year that tree is planted, do not do any pruning except to take off anything that's injured. You want to leave as many buds on there as possible. Now the next season, after it's one year in the ground, then go ahead and do your pruning in order to get the shape of the tree you want. So be patient on that. That's all right. It's just about that time to prepare the soil and plan to dig that hole for that landscape tree you'll be investing in soon, which will make a great addition to your setting, of course. And these are good tips to follow toward that end. Ward, thank you for coming over. You bet. Horticulturist Ward Upham, K-State Research and Extension with us on this week's Horticulture segment. And thanks to you for tuning in. Please be back with us here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Music.